Curator of Education here at the Fleming Museum, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's uh, reading of The Painted Word. Before I turn the mic over to Kelly McIntyre, she is a senior from Connecticut who will be introducing our poet tonight. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about this artwork that we're surrounded by here in the Marble Court. We have a fabulous new show called High Trash in the exhibit over to this side. And this installation is a part of it. It's by Bright Eke. He's an artist who was born in Nigeria. He works in the United States a lot. And he um, worked with some students down at the Tang Museum at Skidmore to create this artwork. And it's called Ripples and Storm One. So I invite you, after the reading, we may just have a few minutes, but if you didn't have a chance to go in the gallery already, if you'll please come back and visit again because it's really wonderful and it will give you a lot of pause and make you think about the way you live your life. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Kelly. Okay. Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Tonight I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Marie Elizabeth Malley to UVM's Painted Word Poetry Series. Marie Elizabeth attended Sarah Lawrence for her Master's in Fine Arts and currently divides her time between New York and Western Massachusetts. She is the author of Steady My Gaze and co-editor of the anthology Villanelles. In my readings of her poems, I find them to be earthly and human, resonant in the body and conscious of its sensations. I liken them to empty mason jars. When it rains, they fill and refract the light. The questions she poses in her poems are insistent but compassionate, honest, and warm as blood. Our own Major Jackson has said of her work, wherever her well-versed gaze lands, whatever chords she seizes and sings, however she chooses to tango across the floor of your imagination, you are assured to be embraced and hypnotically swept up by her stylish rotations of thought and pivoting reflections. Mark Doty offers, Marie Elizabeth Malley wants the honeyed sizzle beyond all language, wants to be a vulnerable and conscious participant in the life of things as they are, and awake to love and the struggle to live freely and compassionately. Please join me in welcoming Marie Elizabeth Malley. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Major, and thank you to the museum and to Chris for having me. And thank you to all of you. History of my body. My nose came with a family crest granted to Bernard in Stockholm in 1731, a virgin holding a fleur-de-lis. The bloodline scattered, my eyes stowaways to the US among folded clothes, at an hacienda outside Caracas, my crooked middle finger curled around a machete and hacked a path through the teeming to plant coffee. My lips arrived in a burro's pack, saddle blanket woven with strands of my hair. The French delivered my cheekbones. No one knows where I got my fine ass, but my breasts come from a long line of women made bitter by war. My stomach, speaks a language of tumors, a language that knows no country, embedded in helices impossible to create or destroy. They never meant to end up in New York, these German legs I wear, and these feet flattened by the pursuit of some ground to call home. Subway. On the six train, a man sits near the tail, leather bomber jacket, baggy jeans, big sneakers. He looks about 40, right eye swollen shut, splashed purple. In his hands, a book. 
He raises his good eye to meet mine, one beat, two beats, three. And I think of the old stories when God would show up on doorsteps in disguises, mendicant monk, elderly woman, mangy dog, to test people. If this guy rang my doorbell, would I let him in? God bless, he says, as I stand to exit the train. On the platform, I turn and stay until the train pulls away. Check the mic. Raise it higher. Is that better? Hello? OK. OK, testing, testing. Hello, hello? OK, good. So I'm going to read uh, the first part of the book. has a lot of poems that um, deal with growing up part Venezuelan, part American, Swedish, although I talk less about that. Um, so I'm going to read a poem. I actually read something crazy today that apparently Hugo Chavez maybe died weeks ago, and they've been lying this whole time, propping him up, pretending he's alive. So I'm going to read this poem. <laughs> After 10 years of Hugo Chavez, a crane stands, spindle-legged and glistening, next to the road between the Avila and the coast, picks at piles of cartons and cans for food. Cars jockey, racing toward Naguata. On the road between the Avila and the coast, where landslides killed over 15,000, cars jockey, raising to racing toward Naguata, whiskey, and a meal at El Pobre Juan. Where landslides killed over 15,000, a toppled No a las Drogas sign rusts. Whiskey and a meal at El Pobre Juan, mixed with salt, salt and gas-laced air and reggaeton. A, a toppled No a las Drogas sign rusts beside a bronze plaque and raised rock in the plaza. Mixed with salt and gas-laced air and reggaeton, Michael Jordan's slam dunk silhouette on a backboard. Beside a bronze plaque and ragged rock in the plaza, landslide survivors were told to forgive the river. Jordan's slam dunk silhouette on a backboard borders the barrio where cockroaches crawl into ears of landslide survivors told to forgive the river. They pick at piles of cartons and cans for food by the barrio where cockroaches crawl and a crane stands, spindle-legged and glistening. You may have heard a lot of repetition in that poem. It's in a form called a pantoum, where the first and third line of each stanza uh, repeat second and fourth, and then the first. Anyway, um, so the third section of the book uh, deals a lot with relationship. So I'm going to read some poems from that. This is a love poem. Strike anywhere. When I say I love you, I mean you are the cyclone in my Coney Island, the hirsute giant in my tent, my snakeskin boy. When you say I love you, you mean you place your heart on a dartboard. Let me take 10 throws. I mean I hand you a shotgun and toss my clay pigeon heart in the air. I mean hot coals and bare feet, a day at the beach, no sunscreen. You mean every time I swing the mallet, the bell clangs and I win another pink rabbit. You mean you can catch every ball thrown from any angle at any speed. When I say I love you, I mean I built you a raft out of matches and hair, lay down on it naked, and handed you the strike pad. This. Uh, there's a series that runs through this section that I'm going to read back to back um, as if they were next to each other. And uh, they're about each year of marriage. First year of marriage. And the epigraph is by Joseph Campbell. Love is the burning point. You get up from the couch to rekindle the fire. I ask if you need a match as you twist the newspaper into a horseshoe and stick it between dim embers and logs. You say no, 
the fire will catch. Everyone says marriage takes work. We do our share. We watch the paper. In the dark night, we wait. Second year of marriage. Over breakfast and the staggering waft of jasmine tea and pesto eggs, you say, if it were your job to create the senses, you would have forgotten smell. I keep my mouth shut, look intrigued. A link to the limbic, the olfactory, the pulse quickening scent, coffee, green, humid air, exhaust of the airport in Venezuela, or the way the geranium in my living room sends me straight back to my grandparents' deck, those summer lunches. Last year, I would have tried to convince you of smell's virtues. Instead, I let it be. Later, we fight over the best way to unlock the car. No matter, your scent, that wordless telegram, still takes me apart like it did when it first arrived out of nowhere. Third year of marriage. A Frenchman in a straw hat, his white linen shirt immaculate, calls, attendez-moi to his friends below. He crawls down sideways, bent in half to hang on to the lone low rope strung along 120 vertiginous steps of the Yucatan's highest pyramid with bee god carvings and a treetops for miles view. I look down and sway. My husband positions himself below and to the side of me, places my hand on his shoulder and says, let's go. We lower left to meet right on narrow, pitted steps in the implicit rhythm of the intimate. I'm crazy. If he goes, I go. But all the way, I hold on to his shoulder, steady. Fourth year of marriage. At our hotel breakfast table, you take the bananas we swiped for snacks and make them kiss. When they start to hump and moan, the couple at the next table staring, I ask you to stop. Then, carefully, you lay the spooned bananas down and tuck them in gently, napkin folded back like a sheet. My laugh makes half the dining room turn around. I think of your penchant for depressive wives, your heroic attempts to cheer up the last one, and now me. How perfect the clowning that often embarrasses, sometimes succeeds. How I hope you'll never give up. Shh, you whisper. The bananas are sleeping. Fifth year of marriage. It didn't seem dangerous, the white dress, the trailing red bouquet, the rose-strewn path. The sun even broke through rain-laden clouds to shine on my face when I spoke my vows. The other night, I told a new friend I got married because I wanted to grow, having gone as far as I could along the wake-up path alone. It's easy to think you're enlightened when no one's leaving clothes on the floor or dishes in the sink. It didn't seem dangerous, this decision to build ourselves a paddock in which to nuzzle, but opening asks for much more than flexibility, the giving up of every story about who we are and could be, alone and together. Marriage, this riding crop, this ground of flames. And uh, I'm gonna read a new-ish poem called Sixth Year of Marriage. Last night, we shared our last bottle of St. Clair, a wine we discovered in our early heart race days. We bought a case and rationed it all these years. Grapefruit notes, perfect with a dinner salad on a spring evening. We often don't know the last time we'll do something until we've already done it. The last time we made love, for example, we were sure there was more to come. When we kissed goodbye last night, outside the stone library, you asked when I thought we'd have our last kiss. I said maybe this was it. Touching my lips scraped by your nascent beard, your mouth a box of teeth. So 
So now I'm going to segue to, um, I've spent the last four out of the last five months in Indonesia. I'm working on a project that combines underwater photography with writing, with poetry primarily. The, it's just, the writing part is still uh, coming along. And so um, I'm going to start, I'm going to read several poems related to underwater, but um, start with this one from the book. And uh, it's called The Diver. In this underwater world with its lobed and convoluted coral, ferns that sway beside fields of garden eels, I float toward a swath of bleached coral, no fish around, and ask myself, how long before this sand is all that's left? Back home a week later, I clip lilacs, their scent diffusing through the room, marvel at the first open peony, its heady perfume, and decide to leave it in the garden with the budding lilies, all planted by the previous owners, his blindness, second brain tumor at 36, forcing them to sell the home they'd built to live in all their lives. Most days, I long for perfection, for everyone to be safe. Maybe the only perfect thing in life is longing. Praise this beautiful, terrible world where we are opened and crushed, where the kiss comes from a mouth that bites. I just saw the connection with that last poem for the first time. <laughs> I've never read them back to back like that. I've, I've only read that other poem once. So, um, so this is a, uh, a longer piece that weaves together a bunch of things. Hum. The star-spattered sky, as seen from the bridge, seems to move instead of the boat. I lay my head down so the rigging frames the moon. Dolphins splash off the starboard beam, but I stay on the bridge roof, my eyes on the rocking stars and moon basket. I don't want to talk about the moon. It gets its light from the sun, like a wife. Even stars forget their names, take a cue from the dark matter fixing them in space. Maybe there's something to be gained from the shedding of a name, to be a bright spot carving its place out of the bottomless dark. The knife is not the answer to every question. What does a pilot's daughter know of the sea? There's no landing strip marked by lights, no orange windsock or favorite greasy spoon. The wind and waves speak another language here, not the language of asphalt and wheel, not even the language of bird, of fish. It's abnormally quiet outside, or maybe I can't hear over the fan. No stars visible through the window, only darkness with its ghosts and promises of freedom. No body without shadow. A healer told me that my upper cervical bones were filled with terror, that I'd hang out in the ethers any time over inhabiting my body. Whenever my neck hurts, I tell my bones, it's okay to be here. I want to be here. I sit by a river, the sounds of ferry, sprinklers, and car alarm in my ears, the freight train of thoughts engine off for a few, and remember how good it feels to stop and listen, emptying and filling like breath. The moment sun on my neck, when for once I'm not running here or there, belly clenched, late. The semester after my first college boyfriend died in a car wreck, he showed up and sat on my bed in a dream, his long dancer's legs crossed, chatting about everything he could still see. From then on, I was afraid he was watching me have sex with the escape ladder of men I climbed to forget. I can't find the scaffolding, feel like I'm hovering in that moment between step out and drop when the cartoon mind still thinks it can scramble back to safety. My windows need washing. I need a handyman I can count on, a hammer in a steady hand, fear as close as a fingernail and it's dirt, grief stone in the belly. What to do with the photo albums? Who gets what? The old life, a bonfire shooting up sparks, Singed wings, all that remain of the pages of a book burned and left on the beach for a poet to find, along with a lone dark stone washed up on the sand. Stones aren't as solid as they seem. Neither are stars. 
I listen for the wave's reminder, crave the salt's sting. On a night dive, I turn off my light and wave my hand through the phosphorescent water, like stars, but close enough to touch, a jellyfish, the new moon. It's not about the fish anymore. My map no longer has feet. No amount of packing tape will hold. I grow adept at salads for one, listen to my own playlist, keep my eyes on the night sky, the stars, ignore the hot, cold hard on his side of the bed. Shiny dime left on the ground because it's face down. Sometimes I hear voices that aren't there. This no longer bothers me. How would life change if I weren't filled with belly clench and nerve quiver? I think I'd miss that hum. Above the nightstand in the place where I'm writing, a black and white photo of Elvis. Voices come through the walls along with bird calls, the stench of garbage cooked by the August sun. It's less about illness and more about the terrain we learned in acupuncture school. Keep your field watered, tilled, and weeded so illness can't take root. In Chinese medicine, lungs mediate the relationship between inside and outside and relate to grief. As a child, I'd wake up suffocating with croup, and my parents would put me in the bathroom with the hot water on full blast until I could breathe again. Stars shine brightest before they burn out, like the flames flare before a person dies. Often they open their eyes and talk again, ask for ice cream, a burger, some wine. Blue balloon drifting over trees, cut string still clenched. Maybe I met God in a lake, crowded with golden jellyfish who follow the sun. Wearing a mask and snorkel, I lay on the lake, and breathed so slowly, I forgot I was there. Thank you. This next poem I, I'm going to read because of this incredible artwork. Um, it's a poem. I was in a workshop, and the teacher gave us an assignment. She said, you know, so often we write from the suffering in our lives and write about the suffering in the world and what's wrong with the world and, and what's wrong with ourselves and everybody else um, and society and all of that. And so the assignment was to write about what you want, to write a hopeful poem, to write your wish down. And um, so this is my wish poem, conveniently titled, Wish. We open the door after a sky-shattering kiss and walk down the street scattered with stars that tickle our feet. When we touch each other, it's not a boat on the surface of the sea at the mercy of wind's temper and the crooked fingers of the rain, but a champagne vent that feeds crabs and albino octopuses who thrive in the dark on the ocean's floor. Coral rebuild their castles in the shapes of brains and fans, and albatrosses can digest spattered plastic as food. We look into a fish's lidless eyes and don't blink. We make love with our eyes open. We no longer need to believe in the stories we made up because we were scared. We say, let's go. Our coats blow open behind us, and we laugh, hands clasped, the trail appearing as we step. Uh, the last um, of the new underwater poems I'm, I wrote, this is my most recent poem. I was on a boat in February, late January, early February, uh, with a conservation organization that's doing amazing work in the Rajan Pot area, eastern part of Indonesia, Indonesian Papua, actually. and. It's uh, the area with the highest biodiversity in the world, and uh, villagers there are, are coming on board with um, partnering with organizations to preserve. The villagers actually own the water and everything in it um, and the land, and so they're partnering with conservation organizations to create no-take zones and sustainable take zones and keep uh, mostly Chinese poacher fishermen out and things like that. And so they asked me to write a poem. Um, they found out I was a poet, and uh, 
said, oh, would you write a poem? We're going to talk about the organization, you know, in two days. And I was like, sure, <laughs> and, uh, and wrote a bad poem. And then the next day they said, so are you ready for tonight? And I was like, yes, and ran down to my room. And, uh, and sometimes it works for me to have a book of poetry I really like. This is more on the topic of craft now. Um, a book I really like open and then maybe my draft and then I start to just kind of write a third thing that's in between not necessarily stealing language from the poet but more the energy of how that person is writing so I happen to have uh, Matthew Dickman's uh, Mayakovsky's Revolver with me which has incredible poems with his poetry has just such momentum you know they just tear down the page so I took that inspiration and my bad draft and crafted this which Luckily, they liked. Um, Ode to Raja Ampat. You sun rays through blue, you tongue-like bodies of antheas that rise and fall together like breath. You bommies and rubble, seven mantas at the tip of bamboo. You sea turtle burying her eggs on the beach. You, the most miracle. You pygmy seahorse male with stretch marks re-impregnated a half hour later. You, the all teeth of moray eel, the shark's bullet body. You, sustainable fishing and no-take zones. You, current thrill and slack. You, climate change oracle. You, school blackboard chalked with math. You, chicken anatomy wall chart. You, school teacher with straight spine and kind eyes. You, barefoot and lipsticked girl. You, satellite dish and sometimes generator. You anchored in a bay for the night under star field and full moon. You soft coral bloom and garden of hard. You limestone island and mangrove. You surgeon fish with tail like a scalpel. You party of silver sides and glass fish. You nudibranchs slither. You dart of dotty back. You wobegon shark asleep on the sand. You school of barracuda. You possibility like a frameless door. So back to the book. Actually, I'm going to read from the Villanelle Anthology. I wrote this poem during the 2008 campaign, and it continues to sadden me that it still applies. <laughs> campaign season. This is a Villanelle, obviously, from <laughs> this anthology, which has a lot of fantastic poems in it. Campaign season. We pray for the troops in a war so unclear on that intricate date-scented desert where a mother spits, house and son gone this year. Kill him, a man at the rally sneers, the first notes of strange fruit plummet the air. We pray for the troops in a war so unclear. Jesus is hailed, community organizers draw jeers. Drill, screeches the Alaskan with upswept hair. A mother spits, house and son gone this year. A Kansas woman says it's Muslims she fears, but they die in uniform for this ground we share. We pray for the troops in a war so unclear. Wall Street and Main Street recklessly steer. The story of a mother named Jocelyn Voltaire, she spits, house foreclosed and son gone this year, moves strangers to send 30K and volunteers. The house stays hers for now, the court declares. We pray for the troops in a war so unclear, a mother spits, house and son gone this year. This is just going to completely this change the mood. It has absolutely nothing to do with the last poem. To the five-inch stilettos I didn't buy 12 years ago. He wanted you more than I did. My boyfriend, when he was five, would crawl under his mother's table when her friends were over. He'd slip off their high heels and stroke their feet. They'd ooh and ah, call him a good boy. He'd bite his two red lips to keep from moaning out loud. He still bit his lips like a nervous squirrel when we were together. 
He begged me to buy you, said I'd never have to walk anywhere, just wear you to bed with sheer black stockings, seam up the back. Now I'm with a man who loves my feet, but doesn't want to lick each toe while dreaming of his mother. Yesterday, I got a pair of sky-high strappy platforms and greeted him at the door, a taller, sexier version of wife. Smiling, I led him to bed and he unstrapped them one by one. Don't be jealous, my pretty patent leather studded five inch darlings. Wrong time, wrong man. Whiskers and Gristle. I believe when the chair in front of mine bears a plaque for a man named Marshall, my dead father's name, it's not an accident. I believe in the white moth clinging to a gas pump, the man playing trombone by the highway as sunset ambers the river. I believe in the before sleep quiver, the scent of rain, these complicated brains in whiskers and gristle. Most days, my heart's letters fall through a hole in the mailman's bag, my mind a slaughterhouse but I believe in the rattle of gravel, that good seltzer should hurt the back of your throat. I believe in needling the ears humunculus, that joy makes a sound bright as brass. I believe in tiny prints of a three-toed bird in the concrete walk, in girders and ivies cling, in honoring my craving for chocolate, that the field secretly loves the plow, I believe in the devil fish's three hearts, the way they leave their arms behind when they're attacked. Actually, we're gonna go back underwater for a second. This is a, I was commissioned to do a self-portrait poem in partnership with an artist. Uh, it, was a, it was a collection of, for a journal of, poems and artwork that were speaking to each other. So, um, so I wrote this self-portrait and he painted a picture of me kind of um, as a squid. <laughs> it, it's hanging in my bedroom. <laughs> Just the hair is kind of squid-like. <laughs> anyway, self-portrait as squid. She would change colors with her moods, flash her eyes in the dark at what scared her. On sunny days, she loved to be lavender, to turn opalescent when the clouds rolled in, brown whenever she felt like it. When she went swimming, she'd blend her belly side to the light coming through the water. If you looked up, all you saw was dappled, rippling blue. At the same time, she matched her back to the depths, so if you searched for her from the dock, all you saw was midnight. She was an ace at hiding. Eventually, she no longer wanted to be alone. She wanted to be found before the fear gnawing at her kidneys developed a taste for her three greenish hearts. One day, a boy came along who wasn't afraid of her color changes, her bad hearing, her smooth hairless skin and long arms. But every time, she wanted badly to let him in. But every time he'd get near her, she'd cover him in ink. She'd go home and tear off an arm in frustration, grow it back by morning. Finally, his mother, tired of having to buy him new white shirts, forbade him to see her again. She wished she could turn off the ink, but knew it was impossible. She set off to find a friend elsewhere. She traveled and traveled and traveled, and still the same problem. After many years, she returned and ran into the boy. By then, he'd been stained by the world and wore only black. He still loved her, all other girls too one-dimensional. Every now and then, he'd have to remind her not to squeeze too hard, not to bite him with her beak, to let up a bit on the inking. But they were happy. He had no problem with her need to be invisible most of the day, as long as when night came, she'd wrap herself around him in their gently rocking bed. So 
So I'm going to close with uh, a poem I wrote to basically kick myself out of a bad mood. Sometimes poems can do that, even to yourself. <laughs> and hopefully it'll do that for you. Uh, thanks so much for being here. It's been great to read to you. Fish gotta swim. No more for you, the genuflect and beg. No longer the cat behind the window, all swivel head and body jerk, as worlds of sparrows fly, nest, mate in open air. What is, is what is. Here's a new prayer, to get right with it. No more wanting what isn't. A hole punched bucket never fills. You're bigger than this flame scatter mind, this hornet sting mind. There's a smile somewhere with your name on it, somewhere a pink balloon. If the bowl is empty, quit going back. Not far, another bowl brimmed with honey and chocolate waits. Take the blinders off, toss them in the gutter. Quit fronting like you're tiny, you sky carrier. Them that make the sound of nothing with your voice, them that told you to make the sound of nothing with your voice are long gone. You have birds inside with unclipped wings. The cage door's latch burns in nobody's hand but yours. Thank you. Thank you. So now is the part where we're going to open the floor to some questions. And I, as a student, just wanted to start out and kind of ask, like, I know you practiced Chinese medicine before you got your MFA. And I just kind of wondered, like, what your journey into writing has been. Oh, sure. So um, I've always been a journaler since my teens. Uh, and when so I was in practice for 13 years, private practice, uh, first as a massage therapist, then as an acupuncturist. And um, in, during that time, my father got sick with cancer. And I was living on the West Coast. He was on the East Coast. And so uh, when the cancer recurred, I had to make a tough decision. And the decision I made was to move back and be with him. So it, it required selling my practice and moving back to New York. And so. I got to spend six months with him before he died, which was really fortunate. And during that time, I spent a lot of it, when I wasn't with him, I spent a lot of it um, just sitting with myself and being really quiet. Um, and in that quiet spaciousness, uh, what started coming through the writing in my journal began to sound more like poems and actually more like teachings. Um, but, you know, in that kind of meditative space, sometimes you hear things. So, um, so I just kept following that thread and, and started working these things into, again, more like teachings rather than poems. But um, it did get me very curious about the craft of writing and about poetry. And I was reading a lot of poetry at the time as well to help me cope with um, my father's illness. And so after he died, I started practice again, but within a few years, my desire to write got stronger than my desire to keep working with patients. So um, that's, you know, it, it actually was kind of a dramatic, I, I read this anthology on a plane coming back from a dive trip. And, um, and it was one of those carpe diem kind of anthologies, like you can change your life, right? And so, <laughs> so I'm at JFK and just read this anthology on the plane and and I thought I can change my life too I don't have to see patients anymore I mean I loved my work but but uh, I just was really done with patient care and um, and so within I was in the process of buying a new office and actually expanding <laughs> so I called my lawyer the minute I got out of the airport I'm like uh, can I get my deposit back <laughs> I actually don't want to expand in fact I want to sell my current office can you help me <laughs> and luckily uh, all of that worked out so there were zoning issues, so I got my deposit back. And, and within six weeks, uh, I'd referred my patients out. And because I don't believe you should be treating patients when you're not fully into it anymore. Um, so within six weeks, I got out. And then, and then I started taking workshops. Um, and it took a few years for me to 
get to the point where I got into an MFA program, but I just started taking workshop after workshop and reading poems, you know, at open mics and and then and then went to Sarah Lawrence. <laughs> Um, you use Spanish in some of your earlier poems. How do you decide when to use that aesthetic over like English vocabulary? Because especially when you use it, it was really nicely placed and added a lot of flair to it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it is a really conscious decision uh, and, and political. For example, the first poem in the book is in Spanish. And there's no explanation of the fact that, tra that the translation is in the back. And I, and I did that on purpose. The first language I spoke was Spanish. And I learned English once I went to school. And for me, it was a, I, I spoke Swedish second, actually. So by the time I hit preschool, English was my third language. And I jumbled them all, as, as any other bilingual kids or trilingual kids would know. Like, you don't know who speaks what. So you just say it all at the same time and hope somebody understands something in what you said. And it, and it takes a few years to sort that out. Um, and so that was my experience. So, so I kind of wanted the reader to enter the book a little disoriented, too, because you wouldn't necessarily expect my first poem to be in Spanish looking at me. So, um, so in that case, that's the rationale for that. And in the poems where I stick a Spanish word in, it's, it's just because it's the best word for the spot. I mean, it's the best word for what I'm trying to say. And, and I try to do it in a way that doesn't shut people out. Not all the things are translated. Like, for example, no a las drogas. Like, you don't speak Spanish, but you can figure out that says no drugs. Probably. Maybe. But, you know, some things aren't translated. And, and the things that I thought might not be clear. I tried to translate in the notes or just make clear. Um, but as a person who n constantly navigates multiple languages, that's sort of just how my mind, like I can't, I mean, it happened today. Major and I had lunch and we were, you know, tripping along and then all of a sudden there was a word I had to, that just came out in Spanish because it's the best word and there's no English word like that, you know? So then, and right? I mean, and, and so it just, um, I hope, I'm not sure I quite answered the question, but that's kind of just how my mind works, and, and it just, I tried not to do it too much, but, but enough that it's how I think, to show how I think. I was wondering if you could comment on whether or not you're still journaling, and if so, what your relationship is between your poetry writing and your writing and your writing and also your Thank you, great questions. Uh, journaling for me is mostly a way that I just come inside. I mean, I, there's a fair amount of like, oh, I went to the store today, blah, 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 you know, had this conversation, you know, like there's a fair amount of that. And then I get into more sort of, it, it helps bring me in and I start writing more, trying to sort out what I'm feeling about something. And rarely will that become a poem. That for me is very different. And often, I mean, it could be like I'm in the middle of writing some kind of emotional question, and then I might turn the page and start a poem. I mean, it can be that fast, the transition, but the, the junk that I spew out most of the time doesn't tend to become a poem. Um, and then uh, major influences, I mean, um, Mark Doty, is a is a big influence on me. He's someone um, whose work I've really, uh, well, I love it. And um, Marie Howe was one of my teachers and is also a huge influence. Kim Adonizio, I've studied a fair amount with her and she's also an influence, her work itself. Um, Martina Spada to some extent, a little bit on the bilingual thing, sort of how to, how to work that, although I'm not quite as overtly political in my work as Martin. Um, I would say those are the main, my main people. I'm trying to think of who I'm forgetting that I'm gonna feel mortified later that I forgot. There's always one and it'll come to me later. Anyway, anybody else? So um, something that I 
kind of been struggling with and I'm wondering like how you may or may not have even dealt with it is um, when did you become a poet? Because um, I kind of see it as a part of identity mm -hmm. and I'm wondering like how that like transition looked for you if, if you even you know, went through it. You know, that's such a good question because, you know, are you a poet because you write poetry? Are you a poet because someone else publishes you, so now you're legit? You know, it, it is a really good question. Uh, I mean, I, I'd say for me, once I committed to go to grad school, I, I began to think of myself as a poet, even though I hadn't been published. I mean, one poem published. but. But for me, it was really when I made the commitment to, to go to school and devote myself to it, um, that's when I think the transition happened for me. Um, I bet that answer is different for every poet you ask. You know, some people have known their poets since they're five. I'm not that person. I came late to it. Uh, I've loved poetry for a long time, but, but to actually say, I'm a poet was a step. It took me a long time because I came out of a whole other background, you know, Chinese, Chinese medicine, you know, the whole thing. So, so for me to really own that, it took, I think, going to school. But. You mentioned a couple of projects with working with visual art as well, and I wonder what those kind of look like for you, if it is the poetry as a reaction to the visual art or how that kind of works. Yeah, that's a great question too. So in the case of the painting, he actually reacted, you know, I was the initiator and um, I, the title poem of the book is an ekphrastic poem. Ekphrastic means um, basically a poem written, inspired by an image. And so the title poem of the book was inspired by a Frida Kahlo painting. Uh, so that said, I rarely ever write poems inspired by visual images and, in, and this underwater, the, the next project I'm working on combines this underwater poems, uh, poems with photographs that I've been taking. And my sense is not to make them too directly matching. So, you know, when I read the poem in the voice of the shark, I'm not necessarily going to show five pictures of sharks right there, you know. Um, I, I like for them to kind of glance off each other in more of an indirect way, where the photographs are doing their own thing and the poems are doing their own thing, and then together it makes a third experience, if that makes sense. Um, so that's so far how it is for me to work with visual art. Uh, that could change the more I do it. I heard you mention meditation a couple of times, and I heard you mention Joseph Goldstein. Yeah. Yeah. And I was wondering, um, is there any particular tradition that you practice? And is there any intersection between your meditation and your creative process? I love your questions. <laughs> uh, I've, well, the, the main tra tradition I'm practicing within for the last several years is Kashmir Shaivism. It's a, it's a branch of uh, philosophy that rose up around the same time as Tibetan Buddhism, actually in the same place. They share similar roots. It's a tantric philosophy that, um, you know, sees the world. It's a non-dual kind of way of seeing the world, which means that there's basically a unity behind all the multiplicity. Um, and that, that unity exists within every single different thing. And so, um, and there, the second section of the book is actually a long poem, or a poem in seven sections. Well, no, it's seven poems. <laughs> um, it's funny, this is, a Major was one of my readers on the manuscript, and, and uh, that poem was a poem in seven sections, and his fantastic suggestion was to make it actually its own section of seven poems, and that was just such a great suggestion and revision on, thank you, on your part. Um, so that poem, is grappling with this question of non-duality, I mean, really directly about, you know, if everything, I mean, you know, how do you deal with the question of evil and really bad things that people do to each other and, uh, and recognize that person as one with yourself? 
you know, and so, so the, the, that whole section deals with that question and it comes directly out of Kashmir Shai, you know, my struggles with that philosophy. And the last section of the book actually comes out of a silent retreat I did with a teacher called Adyashanti, who's another teacher who I really like, who comes out again out of, he's a Zeni, he comes out of the Zen tradition, but broke off from Zen and is a non-dual teacher as well. Very clean, not full of jargon and stories and stuff. He's very, he's like a California dude, you know, <laughs> was a swimmer. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so, so those, that's kind of the, where I tend to land in terms of philosophy that I resonate with. And in terms of the creative process, uh, it does help me to sit quietly, you know, before I write, just to kind of allow things to sift out and try to access something that's beneath the chatter. Not that I'm successful at that very often, but at least that's the intention. You know, for me, I, I, I really want to feel something when I write, and I want the reader to feel something. And I think in order to get to that place, we need to kind of try to get below the typical space we move through the day in. Because normally we're just trying to function and get through the day and get everything done and, and um, and that's not a space of deep feeling, really. So that's. Um, how have you overcome some of the bigger obstacles in your writing? Not necessarily the publishing of the system or things like that, but if you started writing, you were saying you weren't in your own heads, you were late to the game, as you said. Mm -hmm. I read a lot. Uh, I think to be a good writer, you got to read, 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 read all the time. I used to read a book a day of poetry. I mean, this size book, you know, an anthology might take me a few days, but I would read a book like this a day, and then I would write, I'd take my favorite poem from that book, and I would write it in a separate journal. So I would, I would feel what the poem felt like through my pen, you know, how, the, how they broke the line, that whole thing, and um, that really helped me improve. I've also taken a lot of workshops and gone to a lot of lectures and read a ton of craft books. I'm, I'm, I'm a craft nerd. Like, I love books. You know, on vacation, I will take a book of craft essays with me on vacation because that's, I just, I'm fascinated by how people break down language and poems and words and look at other people's poetry, how they dissect that. Uh, so all those ways. And I, I really try to, um, if I notice a certain habit, and I, I know my habits, like when I first, my first semester at Sarah Lawrence, Marie, what, Marie Howe was my teacher, and in my first conference with her, she said, you are forbidden to use the word grace for six months. And Marie will do that. Marie will just say, oh, that word that shows up in every other poem, can't use it, gone, off the list for six months. So I had to find a way to write about the experience of grace without using the word. And so I try to still do that. If I notice a particular word cropping up a lot and it's becoming a sort of shorthand for something, I cut it out and I try to find another way to say it. But I'm going to champion reading, because that is the number one thing to be a better writer. You've got to read. I'll ask the last question. OK. Um, um, it is said that writers really hover around maybe two or three themes. Um, and your reading today has me revised that a little bit to say that there's some images that reappear. Absolutely. One of them was uh, this old life of bonfire setting off sparks. I, think. Mm. I was thinking about uh, fire in your, in your work. And so I'm wondering how would you describe your themes and what images uh, are you obsess around by yourself? Fire definitely is a big one for me, um, aside from being a fire sign. <laughs> and my grandparents died in a fire. Um, I mean, there's just so much fire in my life. 
Uh, so that is a, a, an image that comes up, a theme that comes up a lot for me. And, and just the image of, of the way it burns things and, and, and disappears, you know, in the ethers. Um, water, obviously, is becoming a, another image that is showing up a lot more. Um, I think one of my major themes is how to bridge, gr again, growing up between three cultures, I both learned how to blend as much as possible wherever I was, but also felt like I never fully fit anywhere, if that makes sense. So in Sweden, I'm the one who's, you know, speaks like a nine-year-old because I didn't grow up there. So my Swedish is really, you know, not, and I never took it in school, so it's very rudimentary at this point. You know, Venezuela, I'm the gringa cousin um, here, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm American, but I'm not fully American. You know, I have this whole other wealth of experience that people don't know when they see me and they assume I'm just a New Yorker and I'm like, oh, but I'm really so much more than that. So um, one of my themes is, I think, trying to bridge across lines of culture and gender and race and class and all this stuff, just trying to find ways to bridge the things that keep us apart. Of course, it's no accident that I'm into non-dual philosophy for the same reason. Um, so I would say bridging, trying to connect, and um, obviously spirituality. I, I, I don't know a good word for that. I don't want to say God because it's kind of bigger than that for me, but um, just trying to touch that internal place. That's another theme that comes up in relationship. I mean, you know, I, I write a lot about love. <laughs> Sex and death. <laughs> um, yeah, so those, those are my main themes. Thank you. Uh, well, can we thank our student host tonight, Kelly and Alexandra? This is, please, yes. I don't think this was ever on. It was never on. Yeah, I don't think so either. Oh, yes, it was actually. Yeah. Um, please come back uh, next month. Uh, we'll hear the local poet Ben L. Shire. Ben sits. Saturday market and he sells poems you can walk up to him and give him a topic and he will write a poem in five minutes for you he might be improvising his whole reading next month um, and then the month after in April um, all the students here will give a fantastic reading and there'll be a big party thank you all for coming Maria Elizabeth will be more than happy to sign the books that you have arrived with as well.